Welcome to this short series of talks as we celebrate the season of Lent. Uh, my name is George Stack and I'm the Archbishop of Cardiff and I'm very happy to be with you today as we uh, journey in faith through these 40 days of Lent. Many of you will have heard the famous saying, life begins at 40, and uh, there's a lot of truth to that remark, of course. But behind it, there's something far more important, and that is the number 40 is itself full of symbol and significance. It's a mystical number, not least in religious life and not least in the Bible. I'm sure you'll remember that the people of Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years as they searched for the promised land. Moses led them but didn't enter the promised land for reasons with which we're all familiar. But that 40 years in the desert is a sort of paradigm of our whole life of faith as we journey towards that promised land, which is union with God, of course. And the story of Noah's Ark. Noah and his wife and uh, the animals, two by two, entering into the ark as a place of refuge, while 40 days and 40 nights there was rain and flooding, purifying the land of its sinfulness. And believe it or not, Noah didn't even live in Wales, but still had to endure 40 days and 40 nights of rain. It's in the Gospel of Matthew that we read in particular that at the beginning of his public ministry, Jesus went out into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was tempted. Jesus, at the beginning of his public ministry, having had 30 years of what we call the hidden life, now steps out into uh, the wider world, as it were. But before he encounters the people to whom he is to proclaim the coming of the kingdom, he takes himself off to a desert place an isolated place, a lonely place, where he discerns the will of God, where he explores what he is called to do, and dare I say, who he is called to be. In other words, in preparation for the intense three years of his public ministry, Jesus steps out into the unknown. And there, as we are told, he confronts uh, isolation, uh, hunger, and temptation. All the things with which we're familiar, if not personally, certainly very much aware of them in the world in which we live. And then we read in the Synoptic Gospels, but particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, that Jesus is tempted by the devil. Turn these stones into bread, and then people will believe in you, says the devil. Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone. There is more that we need to nurture and feed and nourish us as we are on this journey of faith. The devil takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple, the centre of Jewish religion, where the worship of God takes place. So that significant place where Jesus is taken, is he going to conform to temple expectations? Is he the one who's going to transform the people's faith into a lived reality? Or is he the one who is going to overwhelm the temple, overcome the temple, present a new covenant, a new way of worshipping God? The time will come when you will worship God neither in this place, on that mountain, or in this church or temple. You will worship God in spirit and in truth, says Jesus. 
And it's very significant, isn't it, that on the day of the crucifixion and death of Jesus, while the veil of the temple is torn in two, the real worship of God, the self-sacrificing worship that Jesus offers to God for the salvation of the human race, is taking place outside the temple, outside Jerusalem, is taking place on the hill of Calvary and on the cross. So Jesus being taken by Satan to the pinnacle of the temple is full of symbolism as he begins his public ministry. And then, of course, the third temptation with which we're so familiar. Jesus is shown the whole world and is tempted by Satan to become a powerful monarch. If you fall down and worship me, all of these temporal goods, all of these cities, all of these political kingdoms will be yours. But you have to fall down and worship me. Get thee behind me, Satan. My kingdom is not of this world. Jesus comes as a king. Remember his words to Pontius Pilate. But not as a king uh, that they would recognize. Jesus is the servant king not a dominant king, not an exploitative king like Herod, but I am among you as one who serves. Do you understand, he said at the Last Supper when he washed the disciples, do you understand what I have done to you if I, your Lord and Master, can kneel and wash your feet? You should wash each other's feet. The symbol of the servant king. This is the kingdom that Jesus comes to bring. So those three temptations, while Jesus is discerning his future, as it were, are very powerful uh, signs to us of the kind of Messiah, the kind of ministry he is going to conduct in his life here on earth and, of course, ultimately in his suffering and his death, sacrificial love, and ultimately in his resurrection. I say all that because here we are in these early days of Lent, and, of course, uh, in other countries, Lent is known as quadragesima, the 40 days. And we, in our turn, step into the experience of Jesus in the desert. And we are called during Lent to enter into the desert of our own lives, to look at those dry and arid and dark places of our own lives and to allow uh, the revelation of God, the Spirit of God, the love of God, to enter in and water, nourish those dry places, those areas of our lives that we hardly dare go to ourselves, never mind anybody else being allowed into those corners of our lives. And in stepping into the footsteps of Jesus, in following him into the desert for the 40 days of Lent, what else are we doing except saying that we too know what it is to be tempted. We know what it is to be distracted. We know the way we ought to go and so often we choose other paths. During Lent, the Church offers us very significant aids, helps in order to explore the dryness of our lives. Do you remember on Ash Wednesday when uh, the priest imposed ashes on our foreheads and said uh, either remember that you are dust and unto dust you shall return? And another sentence that can be used on Ash Wednesday, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent, be converted, turn back 
be refreshed, be renewed. And as I say, the church offers us uh, many different ways in which to uh, exercise that transformation in our lives. They're summed up, of course, in three very straightforward words, uh, prayer, fasting, and works of charity. What else is prayer? Is opening our minds and hearts to the impulse, the breath, of God's Spirit within us, stepping aside from the distractions of everyday living and offering to God the most precious gift that we have given to us by God himself, which is our time, our lives. I often think in moments of prayer that I take this precious gift of time and I offer it to God asking nothing in return because these moments of silence, these moments of prayer are an act of thanksgiving for the gift of life and of love and of time itself which I have received. And if God wants nothing to happen during this sacred time, during this silence of my heart, then I am giving the gift. I'm not demanding anything in return. This is what Cardinal Newman used to call heart speaking to heart in the silence of the heart. I love the words of Mother Teresa when she was asked, uh, uh, when she adored the blessed sacrament, adoration of the presence of Jesus Christ in the blessed sacrament. What do you do when you pray? And she said, I listen to God. And what does God do when you pray, she says. He, she said, God listens to me. The heart speaking to the heart in the silence of the heart is that refreshing of the desert place to which we are called during Lent. And of course, we have all sorts of other devotions, which we'll speak about during another Lenten talk, not least the Stations of the Cross, where we follow in the footsteps of Jesus to Jerusalem, to Calvary, to the Cross, and ultimately, of course, to the uh, Easter Garden. Prayer, fasting, giving things up for Lent. Why do we do those small acts of penance, outward signs of inner conversion, giving up sweets or chocolate or cigarettes or alcohol or watching television. These are trivial things in themselves. But what else are they saying except I am not defined by my dependence on uh, these things. I can give them up as an outward sign of an inner conversion. And that too then becomes a, a symbol of our turning back to the authentic following of Jesus Christ. So prayer and fasting, abstinence as we call it, and works of charity, no good giving things up if then I pocket the proceeds of what I've saved by not spending money on my habits. Part and parcel of the Lenten exercise is that I deprive myself of what I've earned, my money, my possessions. I deprive myself of those things in order to express a solidarity with those who do not have such things. I care for the poor. I give alms to the poor. I deprive myself of my hard-earned money in order that I can express compassion, compassio, suffering with those who are in any need whatsoever. So in following Jesus out into the desert, in following Jesus into the desert of my life, I need all sorts of uh, uh, signposts and assistance and help. 
and the church offers these things to me in her Lenten exercises. Uh, prayer, as I say, fasting, uh, almsgiving, the sacramental life, not least, the sacrament of penance, reconciliation, confession. But hopefully we'll talk about those things later on in our Lenten series. I'd like to conclude, if I may, by uh, showing you a leaflet which I've distributed around the parishes and it's called uh, Cherishing Fasting because fasting is the great safeguard along with prayer and almsgiving. These are the, um, the supports we have in our Lenten journey. And as St. Ambrose of Milan says, fasting is food for the soul and nourishment for the spirit. I think that's a very, very powerful phrase. But if I may just conclude with a poem in this pamphlet, which uh, I circulated in the parishes. It's a poem for Ash Wednesday by a man called Harold MacDonald. And this is what he says. My heart is ready. Yes, my heart is ready. Like a desert I am parched. My soul of sand soaks up the rain at once and is dry again. And the inner fount of life is rank and deadly. In such abysmal straits, remind the self that we are loved for all our self-despair. That Jesus Christ has sought us out. That care will open up the inner streams of health. God's love is real, and God's affection never spent. So be watered, tended, be refreshed this Lent. <laughs>